I'm Eddie Chomney of Hebraic Heritage Ministries, and we welcome you to the Hebraic Heritage Ministries Yeshiva Discipleship Program. In this teaching, we're going to be sharing with you on the book of Romans, and we're going to be sharing with you insights regarding the book of Romans from a Hebraic perspective. In doing so, we are going to begin by looking at Romans in chapter 1, verse 17, which says the just shall live by faith. And in conjunction with doing a biblical examination of the meaning of these words, we are going to link it with Romans chapters 2 through 4. And in doing so, we're going to see what the Torah and the prophets teach about the righteousness of God and about what God requires for us. And we will ultimately see that the Torah and the prophets teach that we are saved by grace through faith. And that principle that's in the Torah and by looking at Abraham and his life as a Torah example for us regarding the righteousness of God in his kingdom. We're going to see how Paul's going to apply the Torah principles to faith in Yeshua as the Messiah. And then we are going to look at Romans chapter 7 verses 1 through 4. Because these verses are misunderstood in traditional Christianity. So we're going to give you a Hebraic explanation of those verses. And then we're going to look at Romans in chapters 9, 10, and 11. And finally, we're going to conclude the teaching by giving you a Hebraic perspective of Romans chapter 14. So that's what we're going to be covering in this teaching. So let's begin with Romans in chapter 1 and verse 17, which says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So Paul here in Romans chapter 1 verse 17 It's quoting from Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4, which says, The just shall live by faith. Now, this word faith is the Strong's number 530 in the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary, and it is the Hebrew word emunah. And emunah means to be steadfast, firm, and faithful. It means fidelity. And so the just or the righteous in God, they will have the characteristic of in trusting in God. They will be firm. They will be steadfast and they will be faithful in their trust in the God of Israel. So without faith, without emunah, without firm trust in the Lord, it is impossible to please God. Hebrews in chapter 11, verse 6, it is written, But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently Seek him. So we see that there's two aspects to faith in pleasing God. One is believing that he is, and the other is that he rewards those that not casually but diligently seek him. Faith is believing what God has said, faith is believing in the promises of God. Paul explains in Romans chapter 9 in verses 7 through 9 the following. 
neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but it's in Isaac or through the promise shall thy seed be called or believing in the promise. That is, they which are the children of the flesh, just because you are a descendant of Abraham, that does not make you a child of God. It's the children of the promise that are counted for Abraham's seed. For this is the word of promise. At that time will I come and Sarah shall have a son. So the promises of God are based upon being in covenant relationship with him. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 18, it is written, In the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt, under the great river, the river Euphrates. And the one that made the covenant with Abraham is Yeshua. And so we are going to see that by looking at Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, which says, And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am Almighty God. Almighty God in Hebrew is El Shaddai. So the one that is making covenant with Abraham, he says that his name is El Shaddai. And it goes on to say, walk before me and be thou perfect. So who is El Shaddai? In Revelation chapter 1 verses 7 and 8, it says regarding Yeshua in verse 7, Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. Then in verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega, which is the first and the last letters in the Greek alphabet. And if we would put this into Hebrew... You would say it, I am the Aleph and the Tav. The Aleph and the Tav being the first and the last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So, I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the ending, says the Lord, the Lord, which is, which was, which is to come, the Almighty. The Lord, the Almighty. So, the one that is the Alpha, the Omega, the one that is the Aleph in the Tav is the Lord who is the Almighty or who is El Shaddai. In Revelation chapter 1 verses 7 and 8 is describing Yeshua. And so Almighty God, El Shaddai, Yeshua is the one that appeared to Abram and made a covenant with Abraham. We can see this as well by looking at Galatians chapter 3 verse 16 as it is written. Now to Abraham any seed were the promises made. He does not say seeds as of many but as of one into your seed which is Messiah. Now when Paul said in Galatians chapter 3 verse 16. Now to Abraham any seed were the promises made. He doesn't say seeds. He's making a reference back to Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, which says, And I will establish my covenant between me and your seed after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto you and to your seed after you. And so to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. And to your seed which is Messiah. And Paul goes on to say in Galatians chapter 3, verse 29, that if you are Messiahs, if you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, then are you Abraham's seed and an heir according to the promise. So how, by believing in Yeshua as the Messiah, are we heirs of what was promised to Abraham? Well, the only way that that is possible is through covenant. Because whenever you accept Yeshua as your Savior and Lord by repenting of your sins and then having his shed blood be the means by which we receive those forgiveness of sins, you enter into a covenant relationship with Yeshua. 
And so that's the new covenant, or actually in Hebrew, it would be the renewed covenant. And that covenant is in the context of a marriage relationship. So whenever you repent of your sins and accept Yeshua's shed blood for the forgiveness of your sins, ask him into your heart and your life, make him Savior and Lord of your life, you enter into covenant relationship with Yeshua. Now, Yeshua made covenant with Abraham. When you enter into covenant relationship with Yeshua, then you are going to be an heir of the covenant in the terms of the covenant that he made with Abraham. So that is how it's possible. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29. That if you are Messiah's. Then are you Abraham's seed. And an heir according to the promise. That is only possible. If Yeshua made covenant with Abraham. So next we're going to see. That the God of Israel saves, redeems or delivers his people. On behalf of the covenant promises that he makes to his people exodus chapter 2 verses 23 and 24 it is written and it came to pass in the process of time that the king of egypt died and the children of israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came up unto god by reason of the bondage and god heard their groaning and god remembered his covenant with abraham with isaac and with jacob and so the god of israel acts on behalf of covenant in the covenant promises that he makes with his people. And so the covenant promises of God are confirmed by his own oath and by his own integrity to do what he says. We see this in Hebrews in chapter 6, verses 13 and 14 and verse 16, as it is written. And when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater to guarantee the covenant promise, he swore by himself, saying, surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. For men verily swear by the greater in an oath is a confirmation to them and it's the end of all debate regarding whether that which you are promising to do will be done. An oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife or doubt regarding the matter. So it says in Hebrews chapter 6 verse 13, when God made promise to Abraham because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself. We see this in Genesis chapter 22, verse 16. And he said, by myself have I sworn, says the Lord, for because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, that in blessing, I will bless you in a multiplying. I will multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven. Genesis chapter 22, verse 17. We are heirs of the promises of God that he makes and provides to us through covenant relationship. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17, it is written, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath. Now, looking at Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, we can see that Abraham expressed faith or trust in the promises that God made to him. Romans chapter 4 verse 1. What shall we say then that Abraham our father has found pertaining to the flesh? Verses 2 and 3. For if Abraham were justified by works, he has whereof to glory, but not before God. But what does the scripture say? And now Paul is Quoting Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so Paul is explaining, given that Abraham is an example to us, he's the father of our faith because he's the father of the covenant 
given that Yeshua made covenant with Abraham, which is the foundation for the coming of the Messiah. And it's the foundation of our relationship with the God of Israel. Because in Romans, in chapter 15 and verse 8, it says, Now I say that Yeshua HaMashiach was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to our fathers. And so Abraham is the father of the covenant that Yeshua made with him. And so Yeshua makes a covenant with Abraham that goes to Isaac, that goes to Jacob, and ultimately Yeshua came and died on the tree to confirm the promises that was made in that covenant. And so given that Abraham is the father of our faith or the example, the Torah example to us, as Paul writes in Romans chapter 4 verse 16, was Abraham declared righteous in the eyes of the God of Israel because of his own merit and trusting in his own merit and his own deeds independent and separate from the God of Israel and his covenant relationship with him? No. It was through his obedience and his trust, his faith, in what the God of Israel promised him that that trust and that faith in Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 is counted as righteousness. And so we see in Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 that Abraham was given an instruction by the God of Israel and a promise to him if he would be willing and obedient and if he would trust to do the instruction that was given to him to receive the promise that the God of Israel was going to provide through Abraham's faithfulness. Genesis chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 it is written, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get you out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you. So this is the instruction. And so the instruction of God comes with the promise and a reward for obeying the instruction. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Continuing on in Genesis chapter 12, verses 3 and 4, and I will bless those that bless you and curse him that curses you and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And so we see then that Abram was leaving his comfortable world, his known world, and he was going to a place that was unknown. And whenever you leave that which was known and comfortable to that which is unknown, it requires faith and trust and confidence to make that step. In making that step, Abram is told that Yeshua, that he's El Shaddai and he's provider and he is Abraham's shield. He's his defense. He's his protector. Genesis chapter 15 verses 1 and 2 and verse 4 it is written and after these things the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying fear not Abram I am your shield and your exceeding great reward in other words I'm the one that's going to reward you for your obedience and I have the power and the ability to do that. And Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing that I go childless and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And behold, the word of the Lord came on him saying, this shall not be your heir, but he that 
shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. So the God of Israel makes Abraham a promise. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 5, it is written, And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell or number the stars, if you're able to do so. And he said, So shall your seed be. So Abraham's righteousness is believing in the promise of God. Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. And he believed or he trusted. And the Hebrew word there is the root of the word that's translated as faith. And the word translated as faith in Hebrew is emunah. And the root of emunah, aman, is the Hebrew word that appears in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6. That he trusted, he had faith in the Lord, and the trust and the faith is counted to him for righteousness. So the Torah teaches that it's in and through covenant relationship with the God of Israel. When we believe his promises, when we put our faith and trust and confidence in him and who he is and what he has said and what he has promised, that is where we have righteousness. The Torah does not teach that we get righteousness in our own merit independent of the God of Israel and through our own deeds that we do in and of and by ourselves. And in Hebrews chapter 11, there's an enumeration of biblical figures who through faith and trusting in the God of Israel established righteousness through that faith, trust and confidence in the God of Israel. And Noah trusted in the promise of God. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. By faith Noah in his obedience to the instruction of God and doing something and being warned of God of something not seen as yet, he become an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. So Noah didn't establish his own righteousness. His obedience was the way in which he received. So faith is believing in the promises of God over and above what your natural circumstances or situation is. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse seven, it is written, for we walk by faith. That is trusting and believing what the God of Israel has said and his integrity to do it because of who he is. Through covenant and not by sight, not by our natural situation or our natural circumstances. Now, Paul explains in Romans chapter 4 verse 19 that the weak in trust, the weak in faith, they are overcome by the natural circumstances And they believe and act upon what they see as the reality of their natural circumstances rather than trusting or believing in the covenant promises of God. Romans chapter 4 verse 19 it is written, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. So if you're weak in faith, you consider your own body or you consider your natural circumstances and so then strong in faith will trust God and believe his promise that that he's made regardless of the natural circumstances Romans chapter 4 
verses 20 and 21, that Abraham staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded that that which God had promised, he was also able to perform it. So the strong in faith puts full trust and confidence in the God of Israel, that you're fully persuaded what God has said and what God has promised that he will do, even though things regarding your natural circumstances or situation may be telling you otherwise. And in being strong in faith, the outcome is when God does what he says, it will bring glory to God. So the righteousness of God is believing his covenant promises to us. Romans chapter 4 verse 22, it is written, And therefore it was imputed to him, that is Abraham, for righteousness, as we see in Genesis chapter 15 in verse 6. So now... Righteousness is trusting, having faith in the Lord. Psalm chapter 4 verse 5, it is written, Offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Psalm 64 verse 10, it is written, The righteous shall be glad in the Lord and shall trust in him, and all the upright in heart shall glory. Psalm chapter 31, verse 1. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. So, Psalms say that we are to trust in the Lord's righteousness. Psalm 71, verses 1 and 2. In thee, O Lord, do I put my trust. Verse 2, deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. We praise the Lord according to his righteousness. Psalm chapter 7, verse 17, I will praise the Lord according to his righteousness. And I will sing praise to the name of the Lord most high. We see that the Lord is our righteousness. Not in our own merit and what we do, independent from the God of Israel and who he is and from his promises. We see that the Lord is our righteousness in Jeremiah chapter 23 verses 5 and 6 as it is written. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king will reign and prosper and will execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. And so Jeremiah 23 verse 5 is speaking about the Messiah. I will raise unto David a righteous branch and a king will reign and prosper and will execute judgment and justice in the earth. That's speaking about the Messiah. Now Jeremiah 23 verse 6 regarding the Messiah it is said and this is his name. This is the name of the Messiah and this is what will be said of him and what he will be called that he the Lord the Messiah he is our righteousness. We can see how Yeshua is our righteousness in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 as it is written, but of him are you in Messiah Yeshua, who of God that Yeshua the Messiah is made unto us wisdom, he's made unto us righteousness, he's made unto us sanctification, he's made unto us redemption. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21 it is written, For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So whenever we repent of our sins and we receive Yeshua's shed blood on the tree for the forgiveness of our sins and In repenting of our sins, when we make him Savior and Lord of our lives, there's a covenant exchange that is made. He gets our sins and we get his righteousness. 
So in salvation, there is imputed righteousness. In other words, we receive a righteousness that we in and of and by ourselves do not deserve. And so this is what Paul is explaining, what the Torah and the prophets teach regarding the issue. As we can see that trusting in their own righteousness did not cause the children of Israel to inherit the promised land. Deuteronomy chapter 9 and verses 4 through 6. First we read Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 4. Do not say in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out from before you. That is the enemies of the children of Israel who were in the land of Canaan. Do not say when the Lord defeats them that it's for my righteousness that the Lord has brought me in to possess the land. But it's because of the wickedness of these nations the Lord does drive them out from before you. Now Deuteronomy chapter 9 verse 6. Understand therefore that the Lord your God gives you not this good land to possess for your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. Back to Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 5. It's not for your righteousness or for your uprightness of your heart do you go to possess the land, but for the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God does drive them out from before you, that he might perform the word which... The Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's doing it based upon the God of Israel is defeating the enemies of the children of Israel for the children of Israel based upon his covenant promises that he makes with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not because of the merit of the children of Israel, but it's because of the wickedness of the nations who are in the land of Canaan. And so it was the right hand or the arm, which is a term for the Messiah, that defeated the enemies of the children of Israel in the promised land. We can see this in Psalm chapter 44, verses 2 and 3, as it is written. How you did drive out the heathen with your hand and planted them. How you did afflict the people and cast them out. For they got not the land in possession by their own sword, neither did their own arm save them. But your right hand and your arm in the light of your countenance, because you had favor unto them. So the Torah says, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 4 through 6, that we receive the blessings of the God of Israel by his covenant promises that he makes to us. And it's not based upon our own righteousness. So the Torah not only says this, but the prophets do as well. We can see this in Ezekiel chapter 33 and verses 12 and 13, as it is written. Therefore, Son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his sin, in the day of his transgression. Neither shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. In what context? Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 13. In this context, when I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, if he trusts in his own righteousness and then commits iniquity and then sins, all his righteousness will not be remembered. But for his sin, his iniquity that he has committed, he will die for it. So if the righteous of the righteous trust in his own righteousness in the day that he sins, then he has no righteousness. Our righteousness comes by faith, trust, and confidence in the God of Israel through covenant relationship by trusting and believing in what he has said or promised in that covenant. So, 
Torah without faith, trust, and confidence in the God of Israel is dead. Galatians chapter 3, in verse 10, Paul writes, For as many that are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that does not continue in all the things that are written in the book of the law to do them. And so then, because... The Torah was given to the nation of Israel as a covenant. If you break any part of the covenant, it's as if you've broken the entire covenant. And according to the terms of the covenant, that if you break any part of the covenant, then the curse comes upon you. So in our own merit, in our own ability In our own wisdom and understanding, nobody is faithful to the covenant 100% of the time. Therefore, we all break the covenant. And that's why Paul explains in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so this is what the Torah teaches, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God of God and that we do not receive righteousness in and of and by ourselves based upon our own merit. It's through trusting in the Lord that is our deliverance, is our salvation. Psalm chapter 18, verse 2, it is written, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation in my high tower. Psalm chapter 27, verse 1, it is written, The Lord is my light, the Lord is my salvation. We can see that the God of Israel is our salvation. In Psalm chapter 38, verse 22, as it is written, Make haste to help me, O Lord of my salvation. Then, in Psalm chapter 95, verse 1, it is written, O come, let us sing unto the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. We can furthermore see how the God of Israel is our salvation. Isaiah chapter 12 in verse 2, it is written, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. We see that the God of Israel is the salvation of Israel in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 23, as it is written, Truly in vain is salvation hoped for from the hills and from the multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel. And so in Romans chapter 4, Paul is teaching from the Torah and explaining what the Torah teaches about faith and trust and confidence in the God of Israel and how our righteousness then comes through our faith, trust, and confidence in the God of Israel and in his covenant and in his covenant promises. Of course, in that covenant, there was a promise of the Messiah who would come and deliver his people. So putting your faith and trust and confidence in the God of Israel and his covenant and his covenant promises is synonymous with trusting in the Messiah for our salvation. So, Abraham didn't earn the promises of God. In Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, now to him that works is the reward. In other words, if I do it, on my own merit, in in my own ability. And if I do something based upon my own merit and my own ability, then I deserve something for what I've done. But if I get something for what I have done, then I do not get it by grace. I get it because I deserve it. So that's what Paul is explaining. Romans chapter 4, verse 4. Now to him that works is the reward. And if you receive something that you deserve, it's not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But 
to him that works not, it's not based upon my own merit, my own ability, and what I have done by myself, independent from the God of Israel, and independent of his covenant and covenant promises. But believe on him that justifies the ungodly, that is the God of Israel, then his faith in the God of Israel is counted for righteousness. So let's summarize what we have learned doing a detailed explanation and teaching of Romans chapter 1 verse 17 that the just shall live by faith. And we have seen the following. Number one, that the righteousness of the God of Israel does not come from our own merit. Number two, the righteousness of the God of Israel comes by faith and trusting in his covenant promises. Number three, Abraham's faith in believing the promises of God was counted as righteousness. And Yeshua is our righteousness and Yeshua is our salvation. Next, we're going to see that the Torah teaches that the nation of Israel was saved by grace through faith. In Exodus, in chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, it is written, And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. And I will give this people favor, and the word favor is the Strong's number 2580 in the Strong's Hebrew Dictionary. And it's the Hebrew word chen. I will give this people grace or favor in the sight of the Egyptians. And it will come to pass that when you go, you will not go empty. And so this word that the King James translates as favor is translated by the King James as Grace in Genesis chapter 6 verse 8. But Noah found grace. That's the Strong's number 2580. The Hebrew word chen. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I will give this people favor. I will give this people chen. I will give this people grace in the sight of the Egyptians. So the grace of the God of Israel was present to save, redeem, or deliver his people out of Egypt based upon the covenant promise that he made to Abraham in Genesis in chapter 15 and verses 13 and 14 as it is written. He said to Abraham, know of a surety that your seed will be a stranger in a land not theirs and will serve them and will afflict them 400 years. And also that nation whom they will serve will I judge and afterward they will come out with great substance. So this is the covenant promise that the God of Israel made to Abram. And so he's going to act upon his covenant promise as we see in Exodus in chapter 2 and then verses 23 and 24. It came to pass in process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came up unto God by reason of the bondage. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And so the God of Israel is going to save, redeem or deliver his people out of Egypt based upon his covenant promises, not based upon the people in their own merit, and they deserve to be brought out of Egypt, that his grace is going to be present upon them and with them to deliver them. But while his grace was present to deliver his people based upon the covenant promises, that he made with Abraham, it also required faith. That is trusting and doing what God has said. And so what did they have to do by faith? 
it was to put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. We see this instruction in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, as it is written, Speak unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month you shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it. So we can see that the children of Israel in being brought out of Egypt were saved by grace through faith. And so being saved by grace through faith based upon the God of Israel being faithful to his covenant promises that he made, which he affirmed by himself through an oath that this is what the Torah teaches. This is the Torah concept. And so notice that after the children of Israel were saved by grace through faith in the God of Israel, then being faithful to his covenant promises, then they were brought to Mount Sinai and they were given instruction regarding how they were to live their lives on a daily basis to please the one who had already saved them by grace through faith. And so Paul then says in Ephesians in chapter 2 in verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. So that is not a unique New Testament concept. This is only Paul affirming what the Torah had already taught primarily through the life of Abraham and then how the God of Israel saved or redeemed or delivered his people out of Egypt. So now Paul writes in Romans chapter 3 verse 20 and verse 28 that salvation or the deliverance of the God of Israel comes by trusting in him who he is and in his faithfulness to his covenant promises. And it's not by us putting trust and confidence in ourselves, in our own ability, and we do not receive righteousness by our own merit. So it says in Romans chapter 3 verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the Torah shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Therefore we conclude that a man is justified by trusting in the God of Israel without the deeds of the Torah or without doing everything that the Torah says and Never violating it. Paul goes on to explain in Romans chapter 4 verse 16 that Abraham is our example. He's the father of our faith regarding God's covenant promises that he makes unto the righteous. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promises might be sure to all the seed. So what makes God's promises sure to all the seed? It's based upon putting your faith, trust, and confidence in Him. Now, if it was based upon our own individual merit that we receive righteousness, then some may have merit and some may not have merit. And so therefore it would be based upon us and therefore... Um, some would receive and some would not. But the God of Israel wants all to receive. So therefore, we in our own selves and our own ability, we, when we look and examine the standards of the covenant, we break the covenant. And so therefore, the promises that the God of Israel makes to his people through the covenant comes by his grace and us putting our faith, trust, and confidence in him. So, we can see then in Galatians chapter 3 verses 6 
and 7, that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Quoting from Genesis chapter 15 and verse 6. Then Galatians chapter 3 verse 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Continuing on, Galatians chapter 3 verses 8 and 9, we see that the righteousness of God by faith comes to those who believe the promises of God. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen or the nations through faith preached before the gospel or the good news unto Abraham saying, in you shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Those who do what Abraham did, they are the children of Abraham. What did Abraham do? Abraham believed the promise that was made to him by the God of Israel, and he acted upon the God of Israel's instruction to him, even though it caused him to leave what was known and comfortable to him and pursue the unknown. And so this is why Paul says in Romans chapter 10, verse 17, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so... We, by hearing the word of God, are able to put our faith, trust, and confidence in the word of God. So now what Paul does, he takes the Torah principle by which he used Abraham as an example for all of us of how God's righteousness works. And he's going to apply those principles to how we receive Yeshua to be our Savior and Lord. In Romans chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, it is written, Now it was not written for his sake alone, that is Abraham's, that it was imputed unto him for righteousness. It wasn't just for Abraham, but it was for us also. Now he's going to take that which Abraham did and apply the principle to... If we follow the same principle, that's how we receive our righteousness in and through the redemptive work of Yeshua when he died on the tree and shed his blood for the forgiveness of our sins. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Yeshua, our Lord, from the dead. In Romans chapter 10 Verses 6 and 8, Paul writes, But the righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. What says it? So he's going to take the righteousness of God, which he's been explaining, particularly in Romans chapters 2, 3, and 4, and he's going to apply that principle to how we receive salvation in Messiah Yeshua. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Yeshua, and if you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, the heart, through faith, trust, and confidence, with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The righteousness of God by faith believes with the heart the promises of God. Romans chapter 10 verse 11. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. So here in Romans chapter 10 verse 11, Paul is making a reference in believing in Yeshua as Messiah. And when you do, you will not be ashamed. He's making a reference to Isaiah chapter 28 verse 16, which says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone. And he that believes shall not make haste. Now, Paul explains that this righteousness of God that brings salvation to us is for both Jew and non-Jew. 
And it works the same way for both Jew and non-Jew. Romans chapter 10, verse 12. For there's no difference between the Jew and the Greek, the Jew and the non-Jew. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that is Yeshua the Messiah, shall be saved. So here in Romans chapter 10 verse 13, Paul is quoting or making a reference to Joel chapter 2 verse 32 as it is written. And it will come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved or shall be delivered. And so Paul is using the Torah and the prophets as the basis for what he's teaching in the book of Romans. And he's taking the principles of the Torah and the prophets and applying those principles to faith in Yeshua as the Messiah for our salvation. So furthermore, we can see that the righteousness and the salvation of the God of Israel is for both Jew and non-Jew in Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, as it is written. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that fears him and does righteousness or works righteousness is accepted with him. So we could see how Paul explained in Romans that the righteousness and salvation of God is for both Jew and non-Jew. Romans chapter 3 verse 30 it is written, seeing it's one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith, that is the Jew, and the uncircumcision through faith, that's the non-Jew. Then Paul asks the question in Romans chapter 4 verse 9, Comes this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or the Jews only or upon the uncircumcision also, the non-Jew, when we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness? How was Abraham regarded as righteous? Paul asked the question in Romans chapter 4 verse 10. When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision. So when was Abraham regarded as righteous for trusting and believing in the promises of God? Well, it's stated in Genesis in chapter 15 and verse 6. Because he was given the instruction and the promise in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And then in doing so, in acting upon it, faith without works is dead. So in acting upon it, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, it says that Abraham believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. So Paul asks the question right here. What is Abraham's situation in Genesis chapter 15, verse 6? At this moment, when God declared him to be righteous before him, was he physically circumcised or physically not circumcised? That's the question that Paul asks in Romans chapter 4, verse 10. And so he answers the question, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So Abraham, being the father of our faith, Romans in chapter 4, verse 16, in being the Torah spiritual example to us regarding how God establishes our righteousness, that here we see that the Torah does not establish that our righteousness comes through the act of being physically circumcised. Our righteousness instead comes through us having a circumcised heart and a circumcised heart will be obedient to the instruction of the God of Israel and will believe with the heart. And so that's what Abram did when he left Ur of the Chaldees 
to go to a land that the God of Israel promised him. And so after Abraham was established to be righteous in the eyes of the God of Israel through his faith, trust, and confidence in him and the promises that was made to him, then afterward in Genesis chapter 17, Abraham was instructed to be physically circumcised. And so physical circumcision did not establish the righteousness. In Romans chapter 4 verse 11 it is written, And Abraham received the sign of circumcision. When did he receive the sign? In Genesis chapter 17. And it says in Genesis 17 verses 10 and 11, This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your seed after you. Every man child among you shall be circumcised and you will circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And it will be a token or a sign of the covenant. So physical circumcision is an outward sign that you have a covenant with the God of Israel and you've already been regarded as being righteous in and through that covenant relationship, which comes by putting faith or trust and confidence in the God of Israel and not putting faith, trust and confidence in your own merit. So Paul then, in teaching the Torah and what the Torah says in Romans chapter 4 verse 11 states, And he, Abraham, received the sign of circumcision, a seal of of the righteousness of the faith, which he had already in Genesis chapter 15, verse six. Yet at that moment in Genesis 15, verse six, he was uncircumcised that he might be the father or the example, the Torah example to all those that believe in Yeshua as the Messiah, though they be not circumcised that righteousness might be imputed unto them also Abraham is our example of proper faith toward the God of Israel and how he establishes righteousness in him Romans chapter 4 verse 12 and the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had being yet uncircumcised. And so Yeshua's ministry is to confirm the promises that was made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Romans chapter 15, verse 8, it is written, Now I say that Yeshua the Messiah was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to our fathers, that is, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So, just like Abraham, we inherit the covenant promises by trusting in the Lord and his righteousness and his salvation. Romans chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham and to his seed through the law. Here it means by our own merit, but through the righteousness of faith, which is by believing in putting trust in the God of Israel and in his promises and his integrity regarding who he is to establish our righteousness. Now, Romans chapter 4, verse 14. For if they which are of the law be heirs in establishing our own righteousness, faith is made void in the promise made of none effect. So now Paul writes and explains in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 9 that the righteousness of God is expressed through faith and being found in him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. And so 
how would my own righteousness be of the law? The only way my own righteousness would be of the law is if I never transgressed the law. My own righteousness according to the law, the Torah teaches that only if I'm faithful to do all the things that are written therein, that is the only the that is the only way that I can have my own righteousness. But given that none of us ever live our lives and always 100% of the time do what the Torah says, then we break the Torah. And so since we break the Torah, then we can't establish our own righteousness according to the Torah. And so that's why Paul says, and be found of him not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Messiah, the righteousness which is of God by faith. As we went over in Deuteronomy in chapter 9 in verses 4 through 6, the Torah teaches that I cannot establish my own righteousness. As we went over in Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 12 and 13, the prophets state, I cannot establish my own righteousness. So now in Romans chapter 9, verse 30, Paul explains that non-Jews trust in the promises of God through the redemptive work of Yeshua. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. So, when the non-Jews put their faith, trust, and confidence in Yeshua and in his redemptive work, and they don't trust in their own righteousness, whether they realize it or not, they are doing what the Torah says. And they were are following after Abraham's example. Now, Paul says that the Jewish nation did not trust in God's righteousness as he explained from Abraham's example to us. In Romans chapter 9, verse 31, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness have not attained to the law of righteousness and so who he's referring to here primarily are Jews that in the first century are called Pharisees and the Pharisees are trying to follow the Torah according to the teachings of the rabbis and in effect they're trying to trust in the teachings of the rabbis rather than putting their faith in Yeshua as the Messiah. And so therefore, by trying to follow the teachings of the rabbis who do not point the Jewish people to Yeshua, the Messiah, Paul is trying to explain that they are not following and doing what the Torah says, that it was Abraham who is our Torah example. And we apply how he was made righteous before God to our faith in Yeshua as the Messiah, which the Pharisees, in seeking to follow the teachings of the rabbis, were not doing. And so that's what Paul is comparing and contrasting here. So Paul goes on to say in Romans chapter 9, verse 32, Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, not trusting in the covenant promises of the God of Israel contained in the Torah, but as it were by the works of the law. And here the context is that they're trusting in their own good deeds, separate and distinct from the Messiah and separate and distinct and not fully seeing that the Torah says 
Cursed is everyone that does not do all the things that are written in the book thereof. And so this is stated in Deuteronomy and chapter 27 in verse 26. And so therefore, by failing to put your faith, trust, and confidence in Yeshua the Messiah and his redemptive work based upon the principle and the example we see in the Torah from Abraham's life, then that's what Paul is referring to, that they're seeking to establish their own righteousness. Paul was not speaking or teaching against following the Torah. He's presenting and teaching and sharing the proper way to follow the Torah. So we see then that the Jews who were the Pharisees of the first century and trying to follow the Torah through the teachings of the rabbis and who did not put their faith, trust and confidence in Yeshua when he shed his blood and died on the tree. Paul's going to explain that they have not followed the Torah righteousness of God, of which Abraham is our father and our example. But by not putting their faith, trust and confidence in Yeshua, that they're establishing their own righteousness. Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 3. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. What's that zeal? That zeal is to follow the Torah, but not according to knowledge. And so they have the zeal to follow the Torah, but they're not properly following the Torah. Because if they were properly following the Torah and seeing Abraham as their example, that they would put their faith, trust, and confidence in the God of Israel as expressed through the redemptive work of the Messiah because the Torah is written about him and points to the Messiah. So they have the zeal for the Torah, uh, but not according to the correct knowledge of what the Torah says. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, which is outlined in the Torah, they're going about to establish their own righteousness, which is independent from the Messiah and the example that the Torah gives through Abraham and his life. And as a result, they've not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God as outlined in the Torah. Paul says that the Torah and the prophets testify of this righteousness of God. Romans chapter 3 verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The righteousness of God being witnessed, the righteousness of God being witnessed by the Torah and the prophets. Romans chapter 3 verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, the application, is to have faith in Yeshua the Messiah, and it's unto all and upon all Jew and non-Jew that believe according to the faith of Abraham. For there is no difference between Jew and non-Jew because the same way that Abraham was righteous in the eyes of the God of Israel, according to that same principle, is how Jew and non-Jew all Come, become righteous before the eyes of the God of Israel. So the application that Paul is making from the Torah principle is that the righteousness of God is trusting in Yeshua's shed blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Romans chapter 3 verses 24 and 25. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Messiah Yeshua, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So how do we have faith in the blood of Yeshua? The same way that Abraham had faith in his walk to be obedient to the instruction that he was given by the God of Israel in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. 
to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Paul explains that God's righteousness, given that it's not based upon our own merit, our own ability, and what we do, independent of trusting in the God of Israel for our salvation, that the righteousness of the God of Israel, therefore, is a gift that he grants and gives to us based upon his faithfulness when we put our faith and trust and confidence in him, his word, and his covenant promises. Romans chapter 5, verse 17, it is written, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, that is the sin of Adam in the garden, much more they which receive the abundance of grace because our righteousness isn't based upon our own merit. And the gift of righteousness that comes through the redemptive work of the Messiah shall reign in life by one Yeshua Messiah. So because our righteousness is a gift and it's based upon the God of Israel's faithfulness to his promises and to fulfill his covenant promises to us. And because it comes by us putting our faith and trust and confidence in him, and it's not based upon our own individual merit independent of the God of Israel, we cannot boast in our own salvation. Romans chapter 3 verse 27, Paul writes, where is boasting then? It's excluded. It cannot be done. By what law? Of works based upon our own merit and what we have done to earn it independent of the God of Israel? No, but by the law of faith. Paul asks the question in Galatians chapter 3 verse 21. Because often in Christianity, in explaining salvation by grace through faith, it is put in this way. But we either follow the law or we follow after faith. And it's put forth that faith is in conflict with following the Torah. So Paul asks the question in Galatians chapter 3 verse 21. Is the law, is the Torah against faith? Is the Torah against the promises of God? Paul says, no, it is not. God forbid. And Paul explains that the Torah gives the parameters and thus the standard of God and it defines for us what sin is. Romans chapter 4 verse 15 at the end of the verse Paul says where there is no law there is no transgression. In order for us to legally sin the Torah must exist because you cannot transgress something that doesn't exist. You can't violate a law that doesn't exist. So the Torah is in existence today because it is possible for someone to sin today. Paul explains in Romans chapter three, verse 20, it's through the Torah and understanding what the Torah says comes the definition or the awareness or the knowledge of what sin is and that we have sinned. And then he asked the question in Romans chapter seven, verse seven, what shall we say? Is the Torah sin? Well, in traditional Christianity, they say that following the Torah is bondage. Sin is bondage. So if following the Torah is bondage and sin is bondage, what is in effect, what's being said is that the Torah is sin. Because they say that following the Torah is bondage, given that bondage is sin. So Paul says, is the Torah sin? And he says, no, God forbid. I had not known sin except through the Torah. I had not known what lust is except the Torah had said, you shall not covet it. And 
So in 1 John chapter 3, verse 4, we have a definition of sin. Whoever commits sin transgresses the Torah. For sin is the transgression of the Torah. Paul writes in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So if we look at the Torah standard, and the Torah was given to the nation of Israel by covenant, and that is why James chapter 2 Verse 10 says, for whosoever would keep the whole Torah, but violates one part of the Torah is guilty of breaking the entire Torah. Why? Because it's given as a covenant. And if you break one part of the covenant, then you have broken the covenant. Because as it says in 1 John chapter 3 verse 4, sin is transgressing the Torah. Sin is breaking the covenant. Now, in order to establish our own righteousness according to what the Torah says, we must obey all the Torah all the time. Romans chapter 10 verse 5. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that the man that does those things shall live by them. He's quoting Leviticus chapter 18 verse 5. That you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, follows the Torah, he will live in them. I am the Lord. If we don't obey all the Torah faithfully all the time, the Torah says, according to the terms of the covenant, that we are under a curse. Paul explains this in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 as it is written. For as many that are of the works of the law are under the curse for it is written cursed is everyone that continues not in all the things that are written in the book of the Torah to do them here in Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 26 cursed be he that confirms not all the words of this Torah to do them and all the people will say amen We can see that if we don't obey all the Torah, we're under a curse. Galatians chapter 3, verses 11 and 12, Paul explains. But that no man is justified by the law, that is, that we're and would be justified by doing exactly everything that the Torah says all the time. No man is justified that way because it is evidence that the righteous shall live by trusting and putting faith in the God of Israel for our salvation because he is our righteousness. Galatians chapter 3 verse 12, and the law is not of faith. In other words, the law is not of faith, meaning that if we endeavor to put our faith and trust and confidence in ourselves, And if we try to have our own righteousness by our own deeds, then the Torah is going to condemn us to a curse because the only way that we can have Torah righteousness based upon our own deeds is if we faithfully 100% of the time always follow and do what the Torah says. And man does not do that. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And so in, and through that means that our own righteousness is not a faith, which is putting our faith, trust and confidence in the God of Israel. But the man that does them shall live in them. Now, Paul goes on to say, In Galatians chapter 3 verse 21. For if there had been a law given which had could have given life. That is based upon our own merit and our own ability. Verily righteousness should have come by our own merit and our own ability. But our righteousness does not come by our own merit and our own ability. And what we do independent of the God of Israel. Our righteousness just like Abraham comes by believing or trusting in the God of Israel, who he is, and in his covenant promises and his faithfulness to do what he said. 
So that's why Paul explains in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, where it appears to say that Messiah is doing away with the Torah, but it says Messiah is the end of the Torah for righteousness to everyone that believes. And so it appears that the text is saying that Messiah does away with the Torah, but the word end is the Strong's number 5056 in the Strong's Greek Dictionary, and it's the Greek word telos, which means the goal, aim, or target. And so this says in the Greek, Messiah is the goal or the aim of the Torah for those who want to have righteousness according to the Torah. Because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, so we need a savior or deliver. That's the Messiah. And that's actually the one that made covenant with Abraham. And so the Torah is meant to point you to the Messiah and the need for the Messiah and to show you that you cannot trust in your own merit for your own righteousness that you fail to meet the test that the Torah gives. So therefore the Torah itself is going to point you to the Messiah and putting your faith, trust and confidence, not in yourself, but in the God of Israel. Yeshua redeems us from the curse of the Torah and the curse of the Torah is not following the Torah and sinning. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 it is written, Messiah has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Why? Being made a curse for us. We deserved the curse, but then he took upon the punishment of the curse. He was made a curse for us because the Torah says, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. And so Paul was quoting or making a reference to Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 22. And if a man has committed a sin worthy of death and he be put to death, ye shall hang him on a tree. Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 23. His body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but you shall in any wise bury him that day. For he that is hanged is accursed of God. Our righteousness is by faith in Yeshua. Galatians chapter 2, verse 21. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, that is in context, putting our our faith, trust, and confidence in ourselves, and what we have done to receive merit independent of the God of Israel, if it came that way, which it doesn't, then Messiah is dead in vain. In other words, we don't need the Messiah. We don't need him to die to save or deliver us if we can achieve our own righteousness in and of and by ourselves independent from the God of Israel. And so because Yeshua took upon himself the curse of the Torah, which is disobedience to the Torah and breaking the covenant, we become righteous when we trust in him, Yeshua, and his redemptive work on the tree when he shed his blood for our salvation. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse 21. For he has made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So let's summarize this part of the teaching. And in doing so, we will conclude Part one of our teaching on looking at the book of Romans from a Hebraic perspective. So the summary of this last part of the teaching is as follows. Number one, we are saved or redeemed by grace through faith in the redemptive work of Messiah Yeshua when he shed his blood on the tree for the forgiveness of our sins. Number two. The righteousness of the God of Israel by grace through faith is for both Jew and non-Jew. Number three, the Torah and the prophets testify of the righteousness of the God of Israel. And that is we cannot trust in ourselves and our own ability 
and what we do, independent from trusting in the God of Israel. But the Torah and the prophets testify that our righteousness only comes by putting our faith, trust, and confidence in the God of Israel and in who he is and in his covenant promises. Finally, number four, Yeshua is the goal or the target of the Torah. It points you to the Messiah. Number five, the righteousness of the God of Israel is a free gift. Number six, the Torah is not against the righteousness of the God of Israel. The Torah shows us what the righteousness of the God of Israel is and how we achieve it. Number seven, in order to establish our own righteousness, we must obey all the Torah all the time, which does not happen because Paul said in Romans chapter three, verse 23, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Number eight, if we do not obey the Torah faithfully all the time, which we do not because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we are under the curse of the Torah. As a result, number nine, trusting in the salvation of Yeshua redeems us from the curse of the Torah. And number 10, our righteousness comes from trusting in Yeshua for our salvation and his redemptive work which he accomplished on the tree when he shed his blood for the purpose of providing forgiveness of our sins whenever we confess our sins and whenever we declare our belief and Yeshua being our Redeemer, our belief in his death, burial, and resurrection and put our faith, trust, and confidence in him and declare that he is our Savior and make a commitment to make him Lord of our lives. So this is going to conclude part one of our teaching on the book of Romans and looking at it from a Hebraic perspective where we have primarily gone over the major things in Romans chapter 1 and the things related to Romans chapter 1 that is found in Romans chapter 2 through 4. So stay with us and we will continue this teaching on the book of Romans from a Hebraic perspective in part 2 of our teaching. Oh, ha, ha, ha.